يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات والله بما تعملون خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله أحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد مدي برضز وسسز الإسلام we continue the introduction to the etiquette of the students of knowledge. <clears throat> we'll go through some live examples from the life of the Salaf, rahimahumullah ta'ala. These examples show the dedication to seeking knowledge. As you know, my dear brothers and sisters, Islam invites its followers to be hard workers in order to have success in this life as well as in the hereafter. Without striving, without work hard, you will neither prosper here in this world, dunya, nor in the akhirah. So the mu'min has to work, has to exert his or her utmost effort to try to excel in everything he or she does. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us in Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 133, and commanded us that we need to exert our utmost efforts and to hasten up and to race towards the Akhirah. He says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَشَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ عرضها السماوات والأرض عدة للمتقين. So here Allah subhanahu wa taala is telling us وسارعوا and march forth in the way which leads to forgiveness from your Lord and for paradise as wide as are the heavens and the earth. Prepared for al muttaqin for the righteous. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to race, to run, to march forth. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَقْبِرَةٍ Run for this maqfira.
this forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Sari'u means you compete. Who will win the race before the other? And so it is a mutual action. Sari'u. You compete with each other. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ So march forth in the way which leads to forgiveness from your Lord. Allah wants us to hurry up to enter this Jannat. Allah invites us for the Jannah. He's telling us, come, march forth, overcome all the obstacles and hurdles in your way. This paradise, this Jannah, which Allah created, which is a reality, existed. The Prophet saw it, enter it, walked in it. This Jannah, as wide as the heavens and the earth. It is so vast. As you know, the last one who will come out from the hellfire. Last one. When he enters the Jannah, first of all, he, when he sees the wall of the Jannah, he said, just take me to next to the walls. And when he hears the conversations of the people in the Jannah, he said, just let me enter. Take me to that tree. And he promised Allah that he will not ask anything more than that. Subhanallah. And Allah <clears throat> grants him whatever he asked. And Allah did not blame him. And then Allah told him, will you be satisfied if I give you an the size of the earth in the Jannah? Said, my Lord. Are you mocking me? You give me this place in the Jannah, like the size of the earth? Said, no, I am not mocking you or belittling you, I'm able to do that. And it is yours and multiple times. This is for the last one who will enter the Jannah. Imagine those who entered the Jannah, huh? among the, the, the early ones, so the Jannah is so big, so vast. The Prophet ﷺ on the night of the Mi'raj, Ibrahim ﷺ told him, inform your Ummah, tell your Ummah, anna al-Jannata qi'an, that Many parts of the Jannah are not cultivated yet, are not planted yet. So ask your Ummah to plant their trees in the Jannah. And how do you plant your tree in the Jannah? Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. So they are malaika, this is their job. 
you start the tasbih, they start planting trees for you in the Jannah. <coughs> Trees that the trunks of the trees are gold. Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Allahumma la tahrimna ya Rabbi. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah. Ameen. Wa jannatin arduha al-samawatu wal-ard. This Jannah, which is as wide as the heavens and the earth, Allah says, "Uiddat, uiddat lil muttaqin." It's already prepared. It's already prepared for you, for the righteous. It's already waiting to receive you. Also, Allah says in Surah Al-Anbiya, describing and telling us about his own prophets. So in Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah 90, 90. So Allah described his prophets. Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. Wayad'oonana raghaban wa rahaba. وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ Indeed, they used to raise in doing good and call upon us with hope and fear, totally humbling themselves before us. So those are, these are the prophets of Allah. Allah described them that they are racing and doing good deeds. Though they are Allah's prophets. But they knew they have to work for their salvation and strive for their salvation. Indeed, they used to race in doing good. So the Iman is not just something resides in one's heart and everyone taps his heart, Iman is here, Iman is here. No, Iman has to be shown and interpreted and manifested in your actions. So you have to do good deeds. No good deeds, no Iman cannot have Iman without working, without doing good deeds. To just say that I say La ilaha Allah Muhammad Rasulullah, that's enough? No, that's not enough. Because the Amal is part of the Iman. So remember, remember, the Iman, the three elements of the Iman, three components of the Iman, the Atiqad, the belief itself, the faith itself, and the Amal, the actions of the limbs, and the utterance, the verbalization. These three things, inseparable, they constitute Iman. If one of them is zero, absent, then no Iman. Iman will be zero. So don't deceive yourself. No Salah, no Siyam, no Zakah, no Hajj, no Iman. Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat this is how Allah's prophets worshipped Allah. Raghaban wa rahaba. So they call upon us with hope and fear. Who are they? 
Allah's prophets. This is how you worship Allah. So the mu'min in the dunya between two states, the state of rahab, fear, and state of raghab, hope, until you die. As the ulama said, you, the mu'min is like a bird flying and balancing its flight with two wings, the wing of hope, the wing of fear. The moment you start to despair of Allah, you feel that you will despair of Allah's mercy because you fear Allah, lower the wing of fear and raise the wing of hope. You start to feel that you will, now you started feeling safe from Allah's <coughs> punishment, lower the wing of hope, raise the wing of fear. And that's how you balance your flight in the dunya till you die. And when you are on the bed of death, lower the wing of fear and raise the wing of hope. Only think good about Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is how we worship Allah. But to say, you worship Allah only out of fear, like the Khawarij, the Kharijites, they did not know Allah Azza wa Jal, and they did not know that their Rabb is the most kind, most merciful. They don't know that. So they were always just, they worshiped Allah out of fear. So they didn't know that he is the merciful Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Wadud, etc. Facing them on the other side, those who say, we love Allah, and we are not afraid of his fire. Those are the Sufis, some of them. We are not afraid of your fire, O oh Allah. And we worship only, we worship you because we love you. Are you better than Allah's prophets who worship Allah out of fear and love? And they attribute to Rabi al Adawiya. Rahimahullah, if she said this, she was mistaken. She cannot be better than Allah's prophet. They said, she said, Allahumma inni la ma'budka khawfan min narika wa la tam'an fi jannatika wa lakin abadtuka la annaka ahla lidaka. Oh, Allah did not worship you because I'm afraid of your fire. Or, be, or I'm coveting and aspiring and yearning for your, your Jannah. But I worship you because you deserve to be worshipped. This is nonsense. Allah's prophets, they worship Allah out of fear and hope. And the Prophet Sallallahu who is the best worshipper, used to say, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah a'udhu bika min al-nar. Oh Allah, I ask you the jannah. And they seek your protection from the hellfire. Rab'a cannot be better than the Prophet Or another Sufi said, Sayyid Bedawi, they say, who has a mausoleum in the Giza in Egypt. He said, I asked my Lord three things, three wishes. He granted me two, he gave me two and refused the third. 
I asked him to forgive whoever attends my birthday celebration. And Allah gave it to me. Astaghfirullahaladzim. They lie. Second thing, to give the reward of Umrah for whoever visits my mausoleum. Allah gave it to me. The third wish which Allah rejected, I asked him to throw me and cast me into the hellfire. Allah said, no. I will not give it to you. Kufr, a'udhu billah. Why? He said, this is supposed to be Wali. <laughs> who, who, that when in his biography, he was not praying. And he's Wali, okay? He said, because if I enter the hellfire, I will just roll, roll my body in the hellfire and it will become metal green, grass, so I will spoil it. That's why Allah said you will not, no, I will not allow you to enter the hellfire because I'm going to spoil it to become green, a garden. And Allah created it to punish the kuffar with it. So when you hear all this nonsense, be aware and I warn you, and my advice for every Muslim, stay away from mysticism and Sufism. Sufism a reality is something foreign to Islam. Sufism is not the, the purification of the soul as they want us to believe that, or to reach the level of Ihsan and the Tazkiyah. It is totally different. <clears throat> and if you want details, you can read many books. And I recommend to read the book of Sheikh Ihsan Ilahi Zahir, Rahimahullah, At Tasawwuf Al Mansha Wal Masada. Sufism, origin and resources. So Allah says here, Innahum kana yusari'una fil khayrati wa yadu'una na raghaban wa rahaba. This is how the prophets of Allah worshipped Allah. And totally humbling themselves before us. So Salvation will not be giving freely. You have to work for it. You have to work hard for your salvation. And now listen to some stories of the Salaf Rahimahullah Ta'ala and see the efforts they exerted. And seeking the ilm and seeking the ilm is ibadah and bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is the best of the righteous deeds. Okay. Staying awake, reading the books is better than the tahajjud. It's better than fasting the nafil fast, etc. Al Hassan al Basra Rahimahullah said, Whoever competes with you for this world, then compete with him for the hereafter. What does that mean? He me it means you don't compete with him in matters of mundane affairs, beat him in doing righteous deeds. That will you, Peter. Though in the dunya, 
it is, as the ulama said, a dunya mazra'atul akhira. Dunya is the farm for the next life, for the hereafter. So here we have to plant, and there we reap the fruit in the akhira. And when we do something in the dunya, we do it to the best of our ability. But the real competition should be in doing like just thieves and compete with each other regarding the issues of the akhirah, who will be in a higher level than the other. So whoever competes with you for this world, then compete with him for the hereafter. As mentioned in Lataif al Ma'arif by Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, rahimahullah. He also said, Sayyidina al Hassan al Basri, whoever competes with you regarding religion, okay, that means learning the deen, mastering the fiqh, then compete with him. But if his competition is only for this world, then throw it to his breast, leave it for him. So what he's saying, compete with each other when it comes to the matter of the deen, matter of the deen. And should try to be better than your competitor, more than your brother and learning your deen more and more and practice the deen more and more. But if someone competes with you only regarding worldly things, mundane affairs, don't consider that. That should not bother you, okay? You do your best, you try to excel, you try to do whatever you do to the best of your ability, but it should not preoccupy your mind. What should, what should preoccupy your mind is the competition regarding the next life, regarding issues of the deen. Know more about the deen, know more about your Islam. Also, Yahya bin Abi Kathir, rahimahullah, said, as reported in Sahih Muslim. He said, knowledge cannot be achieved by the rest of the body or while the body is relaxed. You cannot have ilm. So my dear brothers and sisters, if you think you can get ilm while you are relaxed, you are dreaming. You are dreaming. Knowledge will not be achieved by that. Knowledge cannot be achieved through the iPad or through Google. Knowledge you have to acquire by attending the circles of the scholars during the day and revising and studying during the night and you sleep only a short period, short period of time. Because you are revising what you studied during the day and preparing for the next day. So when you go to the circle the next day, you already prepared yourself. This is how you will acquire and gain and build up your ilm, your knowledge. But if you think you will acquire ilm and gain knowledge by attending the course for a few semesters, 
and then they give you a piece of paper certificate that you are a graduate, forget about it. That will not make you a student of knowledge. You only study and revise what the exam. After the exam, if you are asked, shh, nothing is there. And what end have you learned and what end have you gained? So knowledge cannot be achieved by the relaxation of the body. Cannot gain in when you are relaxed. You have to spend many nights without sleep. That's why, do you think those scholars who left this legacy for us, they were relaxed. No, they use every second and minute. So that's why they managed to write these volumes, which we have. Imam Nawai, rahimahullah, he died young. And see his works and others like him. So Yahya bin Abi Kathir, rahimahullah, said, Knowledge cannot be achieved by the relaxation of the body. You cannot acquire and gain knowledge when you are relaxed. Muhammad ibn Tahar al Maqdisi rahimahullah said He said I Past blood instead of urine. I urinated blood, not urine, while I was seeking the hadith. My urine was blood coming out. While I was seeking the hadith, when I was traveling to seek the hadith of the Prophet from the scholars once in Baghdad and once in Mecca. So he, he's saying I passed blood two times. My urine became blood two times. Once in Baghdad. And another time in Mecca. Why, he explained because I was walking barefooted during summer because of the heat, because I was walking barefooted. I didn't have mount. I didn't have horse or a donkey or a mule or whatever, because I was walking barefooted during summer. And I had ridden no beast during my journey, except once. And I was carrying my books on my back. Unquote. The reference, Tadkiratul Huffad by Imam al Dahabi, volume number four, page 1242. So that's why they became scholars. That's why they became imams. They worked hard. Traveling on there, barefooted, no shoes. From one country to another country. 
to collect and compile the ahadith of the Prophet So because of that, he said twice, my urine turned into blood. Blood is coming out, once in Baghdad and once in Mecca. Because he was traveling in summer, they put it, walking. And on top of that, his books on his back. Ali ibn al-Madini rahimahullah said, Ali ibn al-Madini is one of the scholars of hadith, one of the experts of the jarh and the ta'deel. What is that? This is a branch of the science of hadith. Al-Jarhu wa Ta'deel. Crediting and discrediting the narrator. They are, he is the, the expert. So now he's going to tell you about the narrator. So there is a criterion. If the narrator doesn't meet, then he will judge this narrator according to the yardstick of the muhaddithin. And their terminologies are very, very precise and accurate. So when they describe thiqatun thabt, thiqatun thabt, this is very, very reliable narrator. Thika, reliable. Imam, oh, mashallah. So they have different grades. So Ali ibn al-Madini is one of those experts. They know each narrator, they know his life, they know <clears throat> his ability, and they know the capability of his, and the capacity of his memory. Is his memory sharp? Does he forget? Allah chose them. Allah chose them. Those scholars, Allah chose them the scholars of hadith to defend and protect the sunnah of the Prophet So, Ali ibn al-Madini rahimallah, Imam Ali ibn al-Madini rahimallah ta'ala said, once a shabi was asked, Imam al-Shabi, was asked, how did you get this amount of knowledge? How did you get this amount of ilm? He said, he said, by trust, putting my trust in Allah Azza wa Jal, with tawakkul ala Allah, and this is the first thing my dear brothers and sisters, and my dear students of knowledge. You put your thiqah, you put your tawakkul in Allah Azza wa Jal, and you rely totally on him. So he said, by putting my trust in Allah, and then traveling throughout the countries. After putting my trust in Allah by traveling, I didn't stay in my town. 
I traveled to see the ulama in different places, in different countries. And there is something called in the science of hadith, the ulu of the isnad, ulu of the isnad. The ulu of the isnad, what does it mean? Okay. That's, this is isnad ali, which means very, very lofty isnad or very high isnad. It is the isnad that has few narrators. So you imagine the isnad like a chain, chain. And this chain made of rings. And each ring represents a narrator. So if between you and the Prophet ﷺ 30 rings, it is wrong, it's not. You are far away. The lesser the narrators between you, so you are climbing. So you're getting high and high, higher, higher, higher. So you're getting closer to the Prophet ﷺ. So If, the, if you have hadith and the isnad, if you narrate us, oh, this is not, hadith is high, and the isnad is high. That's why they were competing with each other. And they traveling to the muhaddithin and scholars in different places to have high isnad. Oh, this sheikh in this has isnad, his isnad is so high, Ali. So they traveled to him to get the ijaza. That's why, why they describe the hadith of some of the hadith of Imam Malik rahimallah as the golden chain, silsila dhahabiyya. Why golden chain? Because Malik says, Haddathana nafi' an ibn Umar. So how many between Imam Malik and the Prophet? Two. Nafi' ibn Umar. Nafi' ibn Umar. That's why it's called golden chain. So the students, they travel. And they visit those mashayikh and those shiukh. and they write the ahadith and they get the attestation and the certification from such scholars. So uh, when he was asked, Imam Sha'bi rahimallah, he said, by putting my trust in Allah, traveling through the countries, Imam Ahmad rahimallah ta'ala, he left Iraq to study with Hadith with uh, Imam Abdul uh, Razak Sanani in Sana'a, in Yemen. And it happened to be the season of Hajj, the Muslim Al Hajj, in Mecca, and they met Abdul Qadir Sanani in Mecca. So they came to Mecca to perform Hajj, then to go to Yemen. Imam Abdul uh, Razak Sanani, Rahimallah, was also coming for Hajj. So they met in Mecca. And they told Imam uh, Abdul Razak that we, are, uh, we left Iraq to study with you in Sana'a. He said, I am here now. I will give you. They said, no. Imam Ahmed said, no. I will not change my niya. I left Iraq to take the hadith from you in Sana'a. And after Hajj, they went together. Subhana Rabbi Azim. So Imam Shabir is saying, by putting my trust in Allah, traveling throughout the countries, and with patience, like the patience of the donkey. So, put 
putting trust in Allah, traveling throughout the countries and suffer patience, like the patience of the donkey. The donkey is a patient animal, patient beast. So he said, and with patience, like the patience of the donkey. So students of knowledge has to be patient. You don't have suffer, you will not succeed. You have to have patience because knowledge will not be gained overnight, over years. You have to be patient with your sheikh, with your scholar. If he gets upset with you, if he gets angry, be patient. It is for your own benefit. Don't say, I will leave the study circle. Because the sheikh was tough with me. So who's the loser? Who is the loser? You are the loser, not the sheikh. So you remain ignorant. So you should have the suburb. And with patience, like the patience of the donkey. And then he said, the fourth thing, an early start like that of a crow. Putting my trust in Allah, traveling to other countries, patience like the patience of the donkey, and fourthly, early start. Early rise in the morning. Early bird catches the world. And early start, like that of a crow, the crow, early morning, you'll hear it. Okay. So he said, an early start, early rise, like that of a crow. <laughs> Subhana Rabbi Rabbi. That's, that's how, that's how. Is there any relaxation here? Any rest? No. Hard work. Hard work. Al-Hafid Abu Al-A'la Al-Hamadani Rahimahullah used to travel every day, every day, 30 farsakh. Every day, 30 farsakh, which is approximately around 150 kilometers. Walking, walking. 150 kilometer walking. And he traveled to Baghdad and Asfahan many times, also walking and carrying his books on his back, loaded with his books on foot, traveling. Reference Tabakat al Hanabila by Abu Ya'la, volume number one, page 326. Tabakat al Hanabila, which means the scholars of the Hanbali jurist, Hanbali scholars. You have books called Tabakat, which means they talk about the different and levels of the scholars in the Madhab. Chronologically, Tabakat al Shafi'iya, Tabakat al Hanabila, etc. Ishaq ibn Rahawai, Rahimallah. All these names are towering figures. He said, 
when Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah traveled to Abdul Razak ibn Hammam al-Sanani seeking knowledge upon his hands in the way to Yemen, he ran out of money, Imam Ahmad. He didn't ask his colleagues to lend him. Imam Ahmad was very poor, and most of the scholars of Hadith and students of Hadith they were very poor. Imam Ahmad, his mother told him, go, I will support you by my needle. Okay, I will stitch clothes and sell. Go, go. I'll take care of you. So when he ran out of money, he hired himself out for the owner of the caravan. He came to the owner of the caravan and said, hire me. I want to work and serve the travelers. And refused to borrow money from his colleagues. He refused. This is mentioned in Fadail Imam Ahmad by Ibn al Jawzi, the merit of Ahmad ibn Hanbal by Ibn al Jawzi. So, the students of Nali, my dear brothers and sisters, these are just few glimpses and examples. You need to work hard if you want to acquire the ilm. Also, it is very important and it is a prerequisite. If you want to know your deen, you need to master the Arabic language. You need to master the Arabic language. Without mastering the Arabic language, you will not know your deen profoundly and in great depth. So the gateway, my dear brothers and sisters, towards profound understanding of Islam is to master the Arabic tongue. Because it is the key for all the sciences of the Sharia, all the hadith, the tafsir, the usul fiqh, name it. And the Quran and the hadith, the sunnah are in Arabic. Imam Shatibi rahimahullah ta'ala said, your understanding of the deen is directly proportional to your mastery, mastery of the Arabic tongue. The more you know the Arabic tongue, the more you will know the deen. Your knowledge is shallow about the Arabic. Your knowledge about the deen will be also shallow because you'll be just reading through translations. You are not able to read directly the Book of Allah and understand it and the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as you know, مَا لَا يَتُمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ The means, okay, to do the obligatory, it becomes obligatory. If the goal, the objective is far, then the means to achieve and get that far becomes also obligatory, becomes far. Prayer is far. And covering the aura is far. Covering your aura, your nakedness in the salah. The means to cover the aura is to have piece of cloth. So buying that piece of cloth becomes fun. 
because without it, you'll not be able to pray. Because you have to cover your aura. So the ruling of the means becomes the ruling of the goal itself. If the goal is for the means become for Something obligatory cannot be achieved except by doing the following, like the, the buy, buying a dress, the garment. So buying the garment becomes fun. Without it, you'll not be able to pay. So that's why knowing the gene is fun. The means to know the gene is the Arabic language. Then learning Arabic will come fun. Without it, you will not be able to understand the deen. Allah says in Surah Yusuf, I number two. إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون. We have sent it down as an Arabic Quran in order that you may understand. وكذلك أنزلناه حكما عربيا. And thus we have sent it in Surah Al Ra'd, Ayah 37. And thus we have sent it, the Quran down to be a judgment of authority in Arabic. Imam Abu Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, rahimahullah, said, learn the Arabic grammar to enable you to speak correctly and fluently, and to, of course, know the speech of Allah and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan rahimahullah said, learn the Arabic grammar in the same way you learn the fara'id and sunan. The same way you learn what is obligatory and what is recommended, learn the Arabic language and the Arabic grammar. Imam Sha'bi rahimahullah said, learning the Arabic grammar is a must. You cannot neglect, neglect it. It is just like salt. Its presence in the food is a must. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to proceed, learn the Sunnah and learn the Arabic language and recite the Quran correctly according to the rules of the language. Imam al-Kasai Imam al kasai is a grammarian himself, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, I met Abu Yusuf al-Qadi. Abu Yusuf al-Qadi is one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. I met Abu Yusuf al-Qadi, rahimahullah, in Harun al-Rashid's court, in the palace of Harun al-Rashid. And Abu Yusuf started to criticize the science of grammar criticizing the science of grammar. So he was criticizing the grammarians. So I remember to say, so I decided to make him realize the importance of it, grammar. So I told him, tell me, you're a Qadi, right? So tell me, if a man say to another man, أنا قاتل غلامك أنا قاتل غلامك and then another one said أنا قاتل قاتل غلامك أنا قاتل قاتل غلامك and another one said أنا قاتل غلامك which of them is the culprit which one is the killer Abu Yusuf said, both of them, both of them. See? So this is the problem if you don't know grammar. 
أنا قاتل غلامك أنا قاتل غلامك أبو يوسف said both of them are the culprits هارون الرشيد رحمه الله was well versed in the language said to Abu Yusuf you are mistaken you are mistaken the one who said Ana qatilu, qatilu ghulamika is the criminal Ana qatilu ghulamika is the culprit the criminal the killer because it is in the past tense it is in the past tense. He already killed your lad. Whereas the statement of the other, Ana qatilun, qatilun, that is in the future. In the future. Then Abu Yusuf from that day was always praising the science, sciences of Arabic and grammar in particular. Reference Mu'jam al-Udaba, volume number 13, page 177. So the Arabic language, my dear brothers and sister, is a must, is a must. So take it very serious, seriously, and start learning Arabic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our knowledge in the deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant us the ikhlas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us remain steadfast on this beautiful deen till we meet him and he is pleased with all of us. Ameen. And may Allah forgive us our faults, ignorance, mistakes. Ameen. And may Allah reward all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, for your patience and attendance. Barakallah fikum. Jazakum Allahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, now, mashallah, we have uh, heard the beautiful session, uh, beautiful lecture by our Sheikh. Uh, now, let us move on to the question and answer session. Uh, the first question, which is in the chat box, uh, uh, can you, Sheikh, please repeat the book title and author name uh, that you mentioned uh, that attendees should read on the Sawuf? Yes, the uh, the name of the book is by Sheikh Ihsan Ilahi Zahir, Rahimullah. At-Tasawwuf Al-Mansha wal masadir It is free on the net, you can download it. And mm -hmm. I recommended students of knowledge to read all the books of the Sheikh. Ihsan ilahi zahir rahimullah ta'ala. At-Tasawwuf Al-Mansha wal masadir The meaning, Sufism, origin and resources. That was the only yes. question. That was the only question uh, written in the chat box. Uh, now we got another question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can you give feedback on site? I think this is uh, not a question. Uh, she is writing about the feedback and all. So that was the only one question we got. And now by this, uh, um, uh, we came to the end of the session. Barakallahu alaikum jazakum Allah khairan wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.